Well, good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you here tonight, and uh, thank you for coming along. Tonight is our second night uh, of presentations on the topic of the real Jesus, and uh, I hope that you enjoy what uh, you hear tonight. Just a couple of announcements before I really get into things that I just want to let you know about. After tonight's presentation, there are going to be some refreshments. There's going to be some hot and cold drinks and bickies and some fruit um, up the back just after we finish. So feel free to, to um, spend some time and, uh, and have some refreshments afterwards. But uh, I also ask that just so that we can keep these presentations hopefully to a, a decent amount of time, if you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any questions, but I just want to ask, if you can ask me um, afterwards, I will be up the back um, having some refreshments as well. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just want to, to leave that till afterwards so that we can keep the presentations to a decent um, time. Also, you will notice when you came in um, that you got a, a name badge. Everyone got a name badge? Um, no one doesn't have one. If you look on the back of your name badge, you'll have a number. Now, the number basically is there so that tonight, at the end of the presentation, we have a, a little door prize each night and we've got a free book that we'll be giving away. And I'll be selecting that number randomly um, from a, a random number generator. And, uh, and so just keep that in mind that that's on the back of your, your name badge there and uh, the lucky person might come away with a free book. I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a, a brief, brief review of last night. Last night, we were asking the question, did Jesus exist at all? Like, is there any evidence that's, that, that gives us any sort of confirmation whether he was a real historical figure and whether the information that we have about this person is at all can be proved to be valid or, or supposedly seems to have any sort of strength to it at all. And last night we looked a little bit, and I just wanted to review a couple of pieces of information that were um, fairly significant. Firstly, we have no uh, original copies of any ancient manuscripts, but we have um, copies of a, a lot of them, uh, but we don't have many, really, because a lot of these ancient manuscripts are written out by hand, as we said, and so there's not many copies left in existence. But we don't have any original copies of any ancient manuscripts. But when we look at the New Testament in just Greek alone, we were talking about how we have over 5,500 different copies of the Greek New Testament. If, how does this compare to other ancient manuscripts? Well, we looked at the next most, uh, most frequently copied and uh, the, the one that we've got the most amount of copies in existence of, of ancient documents, the next one is the Iliad, Homer's the Iliad, and that we've only got about 643 copies of that. So as far as ancient manuscripts go, the New Testament has a lot of copies out there. The other thing we looked at, and just briefly, I won't go through this in detail, we were just looking at the time gap between when these documents were first written to when we've got the earliest copies of those documents. And in most ancient documents, that time gap is quite a large time gap. You can see there, for a lot of uh, fairly famous historians, there's time gaps between the earliest, from when it was written to the earliest copy of sometimes about 1,400 years, and there's not many copies in existence. When we look at the New Testament, if we want to look at the complete New Testament, the earliest copy we have of the complete New Testament it's about 325 AD, which is only a time gap from when it was written of about 225 years, which is pretty good. So we, we basically had a look at some of this evidence and, and uh, concluded that it seems likely that Jesus did exist, that he was a real figure of history, and that the New Testament is actually a, a highly reliable historical document. So tonight we want to ask the next question that comes to mind, uh, to, to my mind really, but to a lot of people's minds today as well, which is, well, why does he even matter? I mean, he might have been a real person, but does he matter anyway? What difference does that make? If this man, Jesus, existed, and even if he said and did some amazing things, the reality is that a lot of people would just say, well, he's only of interest to religious people. He only has any significance for people who are religious types. He has no relevance to the average person on the street, and what has Jesus done for anyone, on the, like the average person on the street, anyway? Well, firstly, let's compare him with other human teachers and leaders. I want you to just think about some of the significant teachers and leaders we have throughout history. 
We have people like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. Well, Jesus, when you have a look at his particular teaching ministry, I want you to keep in mind, his ministry was recorded for only lasting three and a half years. He was from a poor background and he had no direct political influence in his day. He never travelled more than 200 kilometres from his home during his ministry. He never entered any major cities other than Jerusalem, which wasn't really considered a major city in those times. And he never ever was, was documented to have written a single word. His followers also, his followers that uh, followed him directly um, after his ministry, were not influential people at all. They didn't come from influential backgrounds, but in fact, they were actually uneducated labourers. So we need to look at the idea of, well, what sort of impact so can we have a look at what he's had on society today? And if we think about, you know, people in general today, what sort of impact do, do people in general have on society? What sort of direct impact can we expect from maybe some great leaders from history? Now, if you think about some of the greatest leaders in history, especially in terms of the empires they set up, we have Alexander, Alexander the Great. We think about Julius Caesar. We also think of people like Napoleon, who's much more recent. I mean, how much of what these people did has a direct bearing and influence on your life today? I'm sure that these people do have some sort of influence on our life. But how exactly do you measure that? How do you find out whether there's anything in our life today that we can link back to these people? We need to ask the question, are the principles which we live by today as a part of human nature and as a part of the sort of values that we have today, are they just natural and normal? Have they always been this way? Have we always seen that throughout human history, principles which we accept today, such that are norm, such as a right to an education, medical care, the right to vote, the concept that a political leader is not above the law, but is actually held accountable to those they represent. The principles of equality and tolerance for those who are different than to us. Are these just normal parts of the human condition? Are they normal parts of who we are as people, or are they not? Can we look back through history and see that this is always how societies have operated and have always been? Well, tonight we're going to look at a few different areas of life and have a look to see whether we can see any influence that Jesus has or hasn't had. The first area we want to look at today is that of life itself. Human value. How do we value human beings? How do we value each other as people? If we have a look at this area, can we see any concrete effect of Jesus' life in our society? Well, in other words, how exactly do we value life and has Jesus had an impact on it? Today it would seem absurd to question whether the human being has a value, wouldn't it? It would seem absolutely absurd to think to ourselves that you would even need to question that. But the value we might place on life today has it always been that way throughout history. Is this just an innate part of human nature that we value life? I want to show you this picture. Well, these two pictures. These two pictures are of me at the birth of my two children. The one here on the left is my young son, Henry, who's now four years old. And the one on the right is my baby girl, Amelia, who is about 18 months old now. Now, you can most probably see from the smile on my face in these pictures, but this was, and uncategorically, these are two of the proudest moments of my entire life. And as a father, I love my children, and I would do absolutely anything for them. But we've got to ask ourselves the question. This picture here, is this how it has looked throughout history at this moment? When a person is born, has it always looked this way throughout history? When we look at ancient cultures and their practices, it becomes very apparent that life was viewed as being incredibly cheap. Things that would horrify us today were commonplace right back at least 2,000 years ago and, and, and past that. They were just seen as a part of daily life. A horrible example of this is the practice of human sacrifice. 
They were practiced in many ancient and pagan cultures. And they weren't just of adults, but quite often we found through archaeology that the vast majority of times it was actually children and infants that were a part of this practice. Now I have to be honest with you, this topic is very disturbing for me. And I want to try to be, uh, go through this topic as sensitively as I possibly can. But ex excavations at ancient temple sites have repeatedly found remains of children who, have, who are ritually sacrificed. And this isn't just in uncivilised cultures. You've got to understand that this is in some of the most civilised cultures of their day, that this sort of practice was happening. By the time we get to the Greco-Roman culture, around the time of Christ, life was actually viewed so cheaply that not only were abortions common, but a practice that was commonly done was killing young children straight after birth. Common, very common. In fact, all children were viewed in Greco-Roman culture as the property of the father up until the age of eight, and he actually had a legal right to kill any of his children without any reason up until that age. And in fact, in, we found in some of old ancient um, Greco-Roman writings that this was actually viewed as a, a practice of beauty to do this. And we think about this and it's disgusting to us. The other thing as well is infants were regularly abandoned to die straight after birth due to them being unwanted and to keep the number of children down in a family, in a society that had no sort of contraceptive. It's actually estimated that in this society, around the time that Jesus lived, the Greco-Roman culture, that up to half of the children born did not make it past the age of eight due to these practices. Now, it wasn't just a small problem. It was something that was happening repeatedly. Now, we are absolutely horrified by this today, aren't we? Absolutely horrified by this. But to them, it was just a part of life. It was just the way it was. Now, if you're a cynic, you might say that the only reason why we're not like this today is because we have the ability to control our offspring. But the question we need to ask is, what impact did Christianity have on some of these practices? Can we go back through history and see if there's any impact? Well, firstly, we need to look at the life of Jesus and his teachings himself. And do we see anywhere in his teachings where he affirms the, the quality, the value of life, and especially that of children? You might see this picture here and you might be familiar with it. There's a story where there are children brought to Jesus for him to bless them. And the disciples who were around them said to him, well, don't bother him. You know, children aren't important in our society. Don't bother him with children. And Jesus actually had this to say. He said, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. That's the sort of value that he placed on children. Another time he takes a child and he uses a child as an example before the disciples and others. And he says, holding this child, he says, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck than to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Did he value children? Did he value life? Everything he taught, he showed that he valued life. As Christianity started to grow in influence throughout the Roman Empire, the values of Jesus, like these ones here, started to impact the way people saw life. In fact, in the second century letter, there was a, a, a letter written to a man called Diognetius. And the person was talking about Christians of his day. And he had to, this to say in a, in a sense of astonishment about the Christians of his day. He said, they marry, they beget children, and they don't destroy their offspring. I mean, they, you know, can you imagine someone who has children and doesn't kill their offspring? Really? It was an astonishing thing that they didn't do this to that culture of the day. Think about that. That's quite amazing. We are so removed from the history back then, we don't even realise what it was like to live then. In fact, we find that by the time of the 6th century, 
and, and it was the time of Christian Emperor Justinian, society had so changed and the value of life had increased so much that he actually put it into law banning the practice of killing young children and he called it murder. And in this code, he actually had to say this about what one must do if they found an abandoned child. He said, see that the child is baptised and that he is treated with Christian care and compassion. They may then be adopted as ad scriptatorium, even as we ourselves have been adopted into the kingdom of grace. And in fact, he actually says, he refers back to the scriptures, the teachings of Jesus, and says, because we've been adopted, supposedly, by God, we need to adopt these children on the same basis. He clearly saw the basis for showing compassion as directly related to how Jesus treated those who chose to follow him. This radical shift in practice and opinion saw Christian institutions setting up and actually inventing such things as orphanages, which hadn't existed before. Life hadn't changed so radically in these days from the time of the Roman Empire when they were actually killing their young children. In fact, at the time when these changes started to occur and they started to value life and value children much more highly in society because of the influence of Christianity in the Roman Empire, it was actually times were getting harder from the height of the Roman Empire as the Roman Empire was starting to fall. So it's not because suddenly life became easier so they decided to keep the children. It was because the values were starting to change. As we go on and we look at the area of human rights, what about other human rights? What about our civil rulers, you know, in regard to our civil rulers? Have we always had the right to vote and have our rulers always been accountable to the people that they serve? Well, in times past, if you are under a ruler, a supreme ruler, whether they be the king or Caesar or Pharaoh, they were above the law. They didn't have to be held to the same law. In fact, the first time in history that we have recorded when the, the, the ruler's subjects held him accountable to them was in 1215 AD. Has anyone heard of the Magna Carta? The Magna Carta was a groundbreaking document. This happened in 1215 AD in Runnymede in England when the English barons came to, to King John and they put this document before him and they forced him to sign it. And this document detailed their rights as subjects of the king. And they held the king to actually be accountable to his own law and to his own subjects. This document is seen as a precursor to all human rights documents and was largely referred to as the basis of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America. And it has been the basis for many other human rights charters today. Well, what exactly, what rights did these barons get from the king back there in 1215? I want to summarise the, the basic rights which they gained from this document. Firstly, was that justice could not be sold or denied to freemen under the barons by the king. In other words, people couldn't bribe the king to either get out of justice because they did something wrong, or they couldn't just be treated unjustly by the king because it was the king's desire to do so. In other words, the king needed to, to follow the law as well. Secondly, no taxes could be raised without an agreement with the barons. This kind of sets the basis for representative kind of government, doesn't it? The barons basically were landowners. And what did they do when they were landowners? They had people who lived on their land. They didn't just rule over the people who lived on their land. They actually had to provide jobs and means of, of people being able to live and survive who lived on their land. So this is kind of the early, early stages of sort of a representative kind of government. Thirdly, no one could be imprisoned without a trial. Isn't it amazing that today we are actually starting to repeal some of these basic rights? Some of these basic rights which form the basis for all human rights documents. Fourthly, property could not be taken from the owner without just compensation. You might ask, what does this have to do with Christianity? 
Well, this charter itself states that it was created out of a reverence for God and for the salvation of our soul and for those of our ancestors and heirs, for the honour of God and the exaltation of the Holy Church and of the, refor the reform of our realm on the advice of our reverend church fathers. That's what it says is that the motivation and the basis of this document in its own, in, in the actual document itself. The other thing as well that's really significant is the very bishops of England were, were significantly involved in the making up of this charter, in making up and coming up with the things that needed to be included in this charter. In fact, the, the, the bishops of England were kind of scolded a little bit by the Pope for even coming up with this stuff, which was interesting. That's another topic in of itself. By the time we get to James Madison, who is the principal architect of the US Constitution, which helped establish the principle of separating powers, and he came up with this whole idea, well, he didn't completely come up with it himself, but the idea of separating the powers. Now, what do I mean by separating the powers? Well, this is a bit of an a, a indication of what it means. And we have this here in Australia today. We have the judiciary. We have the legislative um, part of our government. And we've got the executive part of our government. Now, the funny thing about Australia is, do we elect the executive part of our government? Do we elect our Prime Minister? No. No. In the United States, they do. They elect the executive part of their government. In Australia, we only elect the legislative part, and then they figure out themselves who's going to be the executive, which is interesting in of itself. But in America, they have much more of this whole idea of separation of powers, and the whole reason why they did this is because of a distrust for human nature. Because they thought, well, human beings tend to muck things up and we need to protect people's rights. It's interesting, James Madison, who, who basically started to put this into the US Constitution, this is an interesting principle, the separation of powers, because today we still use whether governments use this separation of powers to define whether it is a country that operates in a free and fair way or not. That's how we decide whether a country is free and fair or not, whether they have these separations of powers. Now, if we have a look at where James Madison got this idea from for separating the powers of government, let's have a look where he got it from. He was directly influenced, and he says this himself, by the French Christian philosopher, Baron de Montesquieu. And he himself, the Baron says himself that the Christian religion is a stranger to mere despotic power. The mildness so frequently recommended in the Gospels is incompatible with the despotic rage with which a prince punishes his subjects. He goes on later to say, We shall see that we owe to Christianity in government a certain political law which human nature can never sufficiently acknowledge. He was basically saying there, in effect, was that without the influence of Jesus Christ on history, we may have never come to the point where we enshrined liberty and justice as principles on which we have government. In fact, when we look at the last hundred years, I want you to reflect. I don't want to point fingers at anything in particular. But reflect in the last hundred or so years, most of the experiments we've had in governance that reject the idea of Christianity, where have they ended up? What have they ended up doing with humans, people's human rights? Most of the time, these experiments have ended up in a serious abuse of people's rights and individuals. None of the above of these things is to mention the direct role Christianity has had in, women suffer in the women's suffrage movement that resulted in women being able to vote, or the role it had to play in the abolition of slavery in the Western world. Slavery still exists today, but in the Western world it's largely gone doesn't even start to, to touch on the whole idea of the separation of church and state, which is the basis on which we have the freedom to, to believe and worship anything we want. It wasn't that way in ancient times. Let's look at our next area of interest tonight, the area of medicine. In many, many ways, when we have a look at the man Jesus, he was like no other man recorded in history in the way that he related to those who were sick or disabled. You know, he didn't just move amongst them, he touched the untouchable. 
He reportedly healed the blind, the lame, and the deaf, and in doing so, he showed a great level of compassion and concern for these people. In fact, at times, he was asked if these people had these conditions because they were bad people. Were these people blind because they were bad people and deserved it? In fact, he upheld those people and said it's not their fault that they have these conditions. He spent much of his time with these people and was interested in their well-being and the well-being of their whole person. Not only was he recorded in doing these things, but he also instructed and taught his disciples to do exactly the same. And it is reported in the early church that these kind of acts of helping people who were sick, helping people who were down and out, was a core part of the early church. But how did the rest of society in Jesus' day view those who were sick? Well, Dionysius, the Christian bishop in the 3rd century, actually describes the predominant compassion and interest for the sick from the Greco-Roman culture during the Alexandrian plague of AD 250. A plague broke out in Alexandria in AD 250, and he describes those who began to being sick as being thrust out into the street, no matter how closely they were related. They were left to suffer and not even being buried once they were dead. In fact, this was in contrast to the Christians in the same place of the day who cared for the sick even at the risk of their own lives. Howard Haggard, a modern historian, describes the behaviour of Romans when sickness broke out as fleeing in fear and leaving the sick without care. He says the Romans saw helping someone who is sick as a sign of weakness. Whereas the Christians believed they were serving God by doing so and following the example of Jesus. You see, largely before Christianity, there is no record of places being established in any society for the care and rest for the sick, which provided nursing and medical treatment for the general populace out of charity. There were some places that were around for the treatment of soldiers, but none of these really were anything like hospitals. And also, there were some places where you could go to a temple and you could rest while you're getting medical advice, but there's no care provided at all. You see, when we have a look at it, Christians were known in the early centuries as looking after people, not just in their institutions, but also in their own homes while they were being persecuted. They started to begin to institutionalise hospices after a while, specifically for the sick of the care and the, the the care of the sick and the poor. The motivation for creating these was directly due to Jesus' command of his followers to care for those who are sick and homeless. The first hospital, in fact, was established by St. Basil in modern-day Turkey in AD 369, and was specifically for the care of the sick and included physicians, nurses, and even schools for teaching those to, look how to, to be able to care for those who are sick. This actually continued to grow, and by the mid-1500s, there are at least 37,000 Benedictine monasteries with facilities for caring for the sick throughout Europe and Asia Minor. I want you to notice what Fielding Garrison says in his introduction to the history of medicine. He says this, there is no certain evidence of any medical institution supported by voluntary contributions till we come to Christian days. Also, we find that belief in Jesus and the need to care for the suffering also inspired this man, Jean-Henri Girard, who is the founder of the Red Cross. He actually was inspired when he saw soldiers lying wounded on the ground on the battlefield in Italy in his day. And what did he have to say for his motivation for setting up this? He had this to say on his deathbed. I am a disciple of Christ as in the first century and nothing more. That was his, his reason and his, and his whole reason for doing the things he did. What about when we look at the area of charities? I mean, charities are around everywhere these days. I mean, how often do you have someone come and knock on your door asking for money all the time? Charities are a huge part of our society. But when we look back to the time of Christ, do we see charities much at all? In fact, we've really got to have a look at the basis of this because when we have a look at the time of Christ in the Greco-Roman culture, there are two words that were used for charitable gifts. 
One was caritas, and that basically means to give something with no thought of return. The other word, and I'll try to pronounce this correctly, was liberal, uh, liberalitas. And basically what that was, that was giving to people with the expectation of getting paid back. Now in the writings of the time, in the Greco-Roman culture, how often do we hear them talking about acts of caritas? How often do we hear them talking about that and, and promoting that as something to do? We actually see very little mention of that at all. In fact, most of the time, we have liberalitas as the, the major thing that is described. You give to someone, but only, you only give if they can give something back to you. And if they can't give something back to you, there's no point in giving to them at all. And we start to see, as far as the, the, the early um, Christian church goes, when they described the acts that they were doing, the acts of charity, what do you think they used? Which word did they use? They used the word caritas. That's actually where we get the word charity from today. It is recorded that mostly the Christians engaged in just exclusively caritas. And it didn't matter to them whether the people they were giving charity to were pagans or whether they were Christians. They gave charity to everyone. Think of what other influential philosophers had to say from the time. Plato said this, he said that a poor man who is no longer able to work should be left to die. That was Plato's take on it. And there was a Roman philosopher, Plautus, and I want you to think about what he says. It's really not too dissimilar to a lot of attitudes in society today. This is what he said. He said, you do a beggar bad service by giving him food and drink because you lose what you give and you prolong his life for more misery. That's why he took, that, that was his take on charity. What's the point? Both of these ideas largely reflected the attitude of the general populace to the underprivileged in that society. This actually led people such as Fielding Garrison to say this. He had to say that the credit of ministering to human suffering on an extended scale belongs to Christianity. The German historian Gerhard Allhorn said that the idea of humanity was wanting in the old world, when you look at some of these documents. Josiah Stant put it this way. He said, Christian ideals have permeated society until non-Christians who claim to live a decent life without religion have forgotten the origin of the very content and the context of their decency. It's a real challenge, in a way, to think about the influence that this man had in so many different areas of life. One of the overwhelming characteristics of the New Testament and Jesus' teachings was the acts, and also the acts of the early church, was the care for the widows, for the sick, for the disabled, for the poor, and for the orphans. It was a direct part of his teachings to do that. Justin Martyr, the early Christian historian, actually says in, that there was collections repeatedly taken in Christian communities, especially for orphans. Even after the legalisation of Christianity in AD 313, the church began to create formal institutions for looking after orphans. You know what they also started to, to do in about the 5th century? They started by the 5th century to develop aged care centres. Now the thing was, most people didn't live past about 30 or 40 in those days, but there were some people who did. And we might think that in that society that they would have cared about the aged and that they would have looked after them in the family. Well, the attitude largely of the Greco-Roman culture of the day was that if someone was old and they couldn't look after themselves, stop feeding them. But it was the Christians by about the 5th century that established uh, care for the aged and institutions for that purpose. Many of the charitable organisations even existing today a lot of them have their beginnings with churches that took it upon themselves to be the aid and relief organisations in society, even when the government wasn't. Let's have a look at education. I mean, how much difference would Jesus have had an impact on education? Well, we see that before Jesus, there was plenty of education around. There were schools. There was education um, given to people before Jesus, and that's very true. But we see that before Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave a direction to his disciples and he told them to instruct and teach others about him and his ways. This led very early on to the development of an instruction manual called the Didache by about AD 80. But
But we see by about AD 150 that formal schools were starting to be formed to dedicate, dedicated to teaching people about Jesus and other literary aspects of faith. One of the most amazing things about these schools, though, was that they didn't just teach men. Guess what? <clears throat> they taught women, but they taught men and women side by side. And this had never been done in that culture at all. And the reason why they did that was because they believed that everyone needed to be taught. Everyone needed to learn about, especially their religion. They believed in educating everyone. <clears throat> From at very early times, Christians broke with the social practice just to educate the upper class as well. But as one historian notes, without reservation to all individuals, classes and nations, it was not limited to one people. They educated all. By the time we get to the Middle Ages and we get to the reformer, Martin Luther, <clears throat> in the 16th century, we actually find that he had a renewed emphasis on education. And he actually urged the civil rules of his day to include primary schools in the common language for both sexes, secondary schools and universities in their activities. He also made a call for the schools to be used to train people for more than just tasks of the clergy, but for everyday things. We also see that John Calvin, who is an early reformer, also advocated a universal education system that trained people for all stations of life. <clears throat> Luther actually was the first person to conceptualise and lobby for a taxpayer-funded school system for all. Along with this, he also, with two other friends, ended up lobbying to the point where the civil rulers actually implemented the first public school system in Germany. Then we get to John Comenius, who was a Moravian bishop, he also instituted schools in his homeland. He did this out of the motivation that failing to educate all people from all backgrounds was a failure of fulfilling the purpose, God's purpose in people's lives. When we look at these people, they, were, they had a very large influence on our modern education system today. In fact, Luther not only helped institute public schools, but he also suggested that the authority, to the authorities that they should make attendance compulsory. I'm sure there's plenty of people here that don't like that idea, but he thought it was a pretty good idea. Another element of education spearheaded by these Christian reformers was that of our graded levels of education. Before then, we didn't have any graded levels of education at all. And they actually started to institute that. They also instituted the idea of secondary schooling. You know, even the idea of kindergartens came from a Christian source. It was Friedrich... Frobel, who saw the value in teaching children at an early age the world of man and nature as connected by God and was motivated to do that. You see, although in the Greco-Roman culture we had systems of culture, uh, systems of learning, especially high learning in their societies, but they didn't teach everyone. They didn't even want to teach everyone. But these places of higher learning never established permanent institutions they never established formalised libraries. They never established a system of students or a system of scholarship. We cannot really trace the idea of modern universities even back to these early philosophers and their schools, even though modern institutions owe many areas of learning to them. The only direct link we get to modern universities today as institutions in their earliest forms was monasteries of the early church. In fact, the earliest link we have is back to the monasteries of St. Benedict of Nursia, and he founded his first monastery in Monte Cassino in Italy in 528 AD. This is the, um, the monastery today. It's a lot different than when he would have founded it, I, I say. In fact, this is actually after a reconstruction. It was blown up in the war as well. But we find that he was the first one that really set up the whole, whole idea of the system of libraries. He placed high value on literature and keeping and preserving them. And in fact, Benedict is known as the godfather of libraries due to the elaborate library system that he helped to invent. What about the first universities? Well, the first universities that we find started to appear around the Middle Ages, especially the first university we talk about is the University of Bologna. And it was founded in 1088 AD. And its main area of study was dedicated to the study of canon law, or the law of the church. In fact, the next university that we have that appeared around AD 1200 was the University of Paris, and it was established with the main purpose of, of uh, the study of theology. 
Both of these universities then actually started to birth other universities in other, in other countries, such as Spain, Scotland, Sweden, Poland, England, and all of Europe. Even when we get to the New World in America, most of the early universities that were set up were set up by Christian institutions. Up until the 19th century, all universities were founded as Christian institutions, regardless of what they taught. Whether they taught stuff that confirmed those Christian beliefs or not, it didn't matter. And this was true even with the rise of science and the study of those theories that contradicted or seemed to conflict with their beliefs. They still held, upheld education as a thing of importance. And that brings us to the area of science. Now, why would we, if we're talking about the influence that Jesus has or hasn't had on society, why would we even bother looking at the area of science? As many people view today, a, view, a belief in God and a study of science are incompatible. So many people believe that today. So why would you even mention this when we're talking about Jesus' influence? Well, like many areas, we are actually a long, long way away from the place and times in which science was developed. And we no longer have a proper appreciation of the environment in which modern scientific theory was actually developed. You see, before we had modern scientific theory, most people who studied the nature of things around us from ancient times, right up until the Middle Ages, were largely influenced by philosophers of old, and especially this man, Aristotle, and his views. In fact, Aristotle's views dominated how people studied things for about 1,500 years. To simply understand his approach to how you would figure things out in nature, he basically said that what you need to do is do this. Sit down and think, and think, and then think a bit more, and then eventually you come up with an idea and you think it makes sense, so you go, I've got it. It's called the deductive, um, deduc deductive approach. Pretty much it comes from purely from thought and discussion on topics. It's pretty amazing how many ideas were actually discovered this way. But if we stop and we went to a university today and we said to ourselves, okay, we want to know why water boils. We want to know why water turns into steam. Let's stop doing experiments. Like, let's just throw all that stuff out. Let's all just get in a room. We'll sit down and we'll think about it and we'll talk about it. We'll come up with something that makes sense to us. And then when we're all in the greens, we'll go, rubber stamp, that's it. If you did that in a university today, how do you think people would react? They would laugh you out of the room. There is no way that they would think that that would be a good way of going about it. But up until about 1500, this was the way everything was done. It was largely done. That's how stuff was worked out. Modern scientific theory is actually based on what we call an inductive model. And it basically means this. It means that we run experiments. We do tests on things and we observe what happens and we make notes. We come up with a theory and then we, we set up a test to test our theory and see whether what we observe agrees with it or not. And then we see if it will work in different situations or not. And this is what we call the inductive model. We find things out by actually testing it and observing. But is this the way we've always figured stuff out? Well, it's actually not. You see, to the ancient pagan mind, and to people like Aristotle, God was where? In everything. God was actually here in this poster. God's in the carpet, God's in the chairs, he's in the lights, he's in everything. He's everywhere and he's in everything. He's in the trees, he's in the air, he's in the water. Everywhere you look, God's actually literally in all of those sorts of things. And so you see to the mindset that they had back then, back into these ancient cultures, testing nature, picking something up and testing it was sacrilegious to actually try to do that. One would never do it. There is no reason either to try to find out the reason why things worked because to them, their ancient gods were pretty weird gods. They, they went around and they just did random things. They didn't act on any kind of rational sort of behaviour. They're, and the, the world wasn't created by God anyway, so why would you expect to find any reason for why anything works? They didn't bother trying to figure out why things worked exactly the reason why, because God was random. He didn't have anything to do with the creation of the world, so just accept how things are. But we see by the Middle Ages that Christianity had finally spread throughout most of Europe. And it had started to change people's worldviews. No longer was God in the things around us, but he'd actually created them. That was their worldview. It had started to change. 
He wasn't in the things, but he created them. And also because they believed that he created the world, he was a rational being. And if he used rational thought to create things, then we should be able to figure out some sort of rational reason why things are the way they are. They started to, to look and, and try to look into creation and, and everything around them and figure out why things were the way they were. And they started to experiment. They started to try to figure stuff out and put it into some sort of equation. Now, the first person that we see that started to, to get this idea of an inductive model where we test things was this man, Robert Grosteste. And he was actually a bishop, a Franciscan bishop in the 12th century. And he came up with this idea. He didn't actually do much with it. He just came up with it. And then this was taken further by Roger Bacon in the next century when he suggested that all things must be verified by experience. Then we come to another Bacon. Francis Bacon, and he was the first person who actually started to put these ideas into motion. He actually started to, to test things. And he's actually called, he's been called the practical creator of the, mo the modern scientific induction or theory. He also write, wrote large amounts on liter of literature on theology as well. You see, all of these people were motivated to find out how the natural world worked because they believed that there was a creator who'd actually created it. They were trying to almost find out the mind of God and how he did things. Why don't we see other cultures around the world developing scientific theories? Why didn't they do this? Well, other cultures have made pretty significant you know, advances in our understanding and our knowledge. But it was only in the context of Christian culture, the Christian culture of Europe, that we saw the scientific theory developed. Because most other cultures believed that it was a bad thing to actually deal with anything in the natural world. Now I want you to read this quote from James Kennedy. Science would have never come into being amongst the animists of Central or Southern Africa, or many other places, because they would have never begun to experiment on the natural world. Since everything, whether trees or stones or animals or anything else, Within it contain living spirits of various gods or ancestors. You see, you wouldn't pick up a blade of grass and go, let's figure out well, how this blade of grass is by pulling it apart, because you might be pulling apart one of your ancestors. You wouldn't do it. That's what the belief system was, and in many parts of the world, it actually still is today. When we look into this, Lynn White says it this way. Lynn White says, from the 13th century onward to the 18th century, every major scientist in effect explained his motivations in religious terms. And you know, it goes on and on and on. We have people like Leonardo da Vinci, who is a, a dedicated Christian, and he actually started to work on uh, dissecting human bodies, cadavers. And he actually did this to try to understand how the human body worked, and he kept notes on it. And many of what of his notes today have laid the foundation for our understanding of the human body. We also come to other people. Now this is Copernicus. He was the first person to suggest that the Earth rotated around the Sun and not the other way around. Which is a pretty, a pretty amazing sort of um, idea to come up with. Then we come to Johann Kepler. And he took these ideas uh, further and developed three different laws that are still used today to describe how the heavenly bodies travel around the Sun. He also was the first person to suggest that weight was actually the mutual attraction between two objects, which laid the foundation for this next man, Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton came up with the idea of gravity. And as we know the story, he was sitting underneath an apple tree one day, an apple fell on his head, and he decided to try to figure out why things were attracted to each other. And he came up with the law of gravity. In fact, he is listed as being one of the most influential people throughout all history because of the, the different things that he came up with. Did you know that this man wrote far more on theology than he ever did on any scientific theory? We also come to people like Blaise Pascal. And he was uh, a person who basically came up with a theory on how to measure pressure. And we actually use his name as a measurement of pressure today. He also invented the syringe and the hydraulic press. We also have this man, Alessandro Volta, who discovered the current, uh, current electricity, and that's where we get the name volts from. We also have this man, George Ohm, 
And he does it develop the measurement of resistance in electricity, where we get the name ohms from. We also have this man as well, Andre Ampere, developed a measurement of the strength of an electrical current, and hence we call them amps after his name. The list goes on and on and on. Well, what does this have to do with God, though? What does this have to do with Jesus? All of these men, their motive for discovery was to discover the God behind the things they were studying, who they believed had created it. Not only did Christianity directly inspire and motivate the development of the scientific theory, but it is also a prime place at the centre of its development in the motivation of many of those who have advanced it. In fact, today we even see people who are still trying to work on the, the um, universal theory. They believe that there is one equation which, by which we can explain all the heavens and how things operate. And this is an experiment being conducted um, underneath the border of Switzerland and France. If you've heard of the CERN project, where there's a massive particle accelerator and they're trying to discover the nature and the fabric of the universe. Now, why would you want to try to discover the nature and the fabric of the universe? I mean, it seems like a pretty hard thing to figure out. Why would you want to do that? A lot of these early, early scientists were motivated by trying to figure out how God had created things. Now, I want you to consider the area of music. Now, this is a pretty interesting area. Who has ever heard of people singing some of the songs that people today sing about Jesus? About any other person? I mean, really, when you think about it, to use some of the lyrics of a popular hymn to make this point, and inserting a politician's name, could you imagine someone singing, All to Abbot I surrender, all to him I freely give? Would anyone ever sing that? I mean, whether you, no matter how much you love him, I mean, let, let's put any other politician's name in. Are you going to do it? Whether you're a Liberal supporter or not, you're not going to sing a song like this. It's absurd to us. We find it preposterous and, quite frankly, insulting to do something like that. But did you know, every single week, in buildings all over the world, there is estimated to be over a billion people singing songs just like this about a person who lived 2,000 years ago. A person who lived 2,000 years ago. They have been recorded to be doing this ever since the end of this man's earthly life. In one of Paul's letters dated from AD 64, uh, 64 there's actually an excerpt of an old, or old hymn to Christ. As early as AD 64, they were singing hymns, songs to this man. We, we also find that uh, Pliny the, the Younger reported to Emperor Trajan in AD 111 that Christians sang hymns to Christ as to a God. Right from the start, they've been singing these songs about this man. There have been more songs written about this one man than anyone has bothered to count. I tried to find out how many songs have been written and no one knew. It just, it's beyond, it's off the charts. No one has even bothered to count. But it's estimated it's least in the hundreds of thousands. And there are thousands of new songs being recorded every year about, of, of songs about this man. We look at some of these albums. These are albums that have been released just recently. And all of them are uh, said to be inspired by this one man and singing songs about him and his life. Thousands and thousands and thousands of songs. Now you'd think to yourself that people who are singing these songs to another human being, surely they're nuts. Why would you do that? Why would you sing a song about another human being? Why would you sing all these songs and keep creating all these songs? It'd have to be crazy, you know, they'd have to be a little bit loopy. But think about some of the people some leading surgeons around the world. This is Ben Carson, the first man to actually do a successful surgery on separating the hemispheres of a person's brain. Brilliant man, and he goes to church every week. Bono. He's reported as being a dedicated Christian. Also, this man, Charles Towns, he, was, he actually got a Nobel Prize in 1964 in physics, and two years later wrote a vivid defence of Christianity, and even our politicians. You know, it's, it's usually actually a rare thing when one of our politicians doesn't regularly attend church. Some of these people are some of the most influential people in our world, and they go and sing songs about this man. In fact, when we have a look at it, some of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written were inspired directly by this man's life. What about Handel's Messiah? Anyone here really enjoyed 
the, especially the Hallelujah Chorus. It's a beautiful piece of music. It's routinely performed all over the world by choirs. And the Hallelujah Chorus is known and loved by millions. It was directly inspired by the events of Jesus' life and is considered as genius. Now, what about others? <clears throat> you know, we think about Christmas. How many people sit down at Christmas and they sit and they listen to nostalgic, you know, nostalgically sit down and listen to songs about who? About someone who lived 2,000 years ago, the human being, just like you and me. And everyone, most people do it, sit down and just listen to these songs about this person and his life. And there's hundreds of them. You know, even in some of the most closed and controlled countries on earth, where carefully constructed personality cults are created around the leaders to inspire devotion, loyalty and a sense of new worship, such as North Korea, how many thousands of people do you see writing songs about Kim Jong-un? Constantly. You just don't see it. What is it about this humble man 2,000 years ago who never wrote a word about himself that inspires people so much? Now, what about literature? Well, let's consider books. There was a statement by one of Jesus' disciples, John. He said, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would have been written. Consider the different books that have been written about Jesus over the last 2,000 years. They pale into insignificance books written about any other figure in history, any other person. They number in the hundreds of thousands. And there's more being written every year, constantly. He is the constant source and inspiration of people who write literature. You know, I couldn't find an accurate estimate of the number of books written about him either, because I don't think anyone can even bother to try to count it. In fact, if you even type his name into Google, you get approximately 583 million web pages that talk about him. If you type in other famous people's names in this interesting experiment, I couldn't find anyone else from history, you know, even 200 years ago, where you could find maybe more than 150 million hits come back of web pages. Whether this is literature supporting this man or attacking him, isn't it interesting that he is still the source of so much discussion all this time later? If he was a hoax and didn't even exist, then why is there so much interest surrounding him? What about Friedrich Nietzsche, who famously over 100 years ago said, God is dead. You know, now we're in the reason of uh, the, the era of rationale and, and logical thought. People are going to figure out that this is all nonsense. But in today's world, it's far from dead. There have been more books written about Jesus in the last hundred years than even all the centuries before that, if you can believe it. It's not decreasing in number, it's increasing. What about the arts? The arts is inspired so much by so many things. Would we expect that significant people in history would inspire artworks? You just need to go down to the MCG and walk around and see all the statues of famous Australian sportsmen. They're all over the place down there. So would we expect to see artwork inspired by this man? <clears throat> in fact, some of the most influential pieces of artwork were inspired directly by him. The Sistine Chapel and that famous fresco that he, that he painted, especially on the ceiling. What about this one? Now, does anyone actually know where this painting actually is? A lot of people think that it's a painting on, you know, on a piece of canvas somewhere. It's actually a fresco. And it's actually in the, um, <coughs> I'll get the, uh, the actual place where it is. It's in the, co the convent of the Santa Maria de, uh, della Grazi in Milan. Now, one piece of uh, artwork which I've only recently um, come to know about is this one. Does anyone know what this statue is called? Has anyone seen it before? It's called the Pieta by Michelangelo. Now, I am not a person that is really taken by artwork. I have to be honest. I go to a to a museum, I mean, to an art gallery, and I walk around and I kind of look at stuff and I go, "It's a picture." Yep, it's a picture. But I have to say, I'm amazed by this piece of artwork. I mean, the detail in this is it has astounded people for centuries around the world. In fact, even if you look at the detail that he has of Christ's face, it is an absolute thing of sheer beauty. 
inspired by Jesus. And in fact, it's even inspired books to be written about reflections on the actual artwork. He continues, again, to be the source of inspiration for so many paintings around the world. Numberless paintings around the world. Now, if we think about also, not just artwork, but I want you to consider literature in general. Now, does anyone know what this is a picture of here? The printing press. The printing press, which revolutionised how we uh, actually make documents and how many documents we can make, was inspired because he wanted to be able to print the Bible. The Bible was in, they had so few copies. And the very first thing that was printed on the printing press was the, the Gutenberg Bible. This was a really interesting slide that I found, the next one. This is the top 10 most read books in the world. And these statistics are just from the last 50 years, based on the number of these books that have been published. Now, this is a bit of a deceptive graph. Okay. Basically, the number isn't from the bottom of the book. It's from this blue line. That's the scale of this graph. It's from that blue line up. What's the most read book over the last 50 years? The most published book? That number doesn't represent 3,900. It represents 3.9 billion. In fact, the Bible is estimated to have been published over 6 billion times throughout history. Now, if it's not an important book and if people don't really care about it, why is it being so read by so many people? It continues to be the most read book in history. It is also the most translated book in history. It is being translated currently in over 2,000 languages. There is currently 1,400 languages that are undergoing translation. And there's only about 6,800 6, languages in the world. In fact, the Bible is available in whole or in part to some 98% of the world's population in a language which they're fluent. That is an amazing statistic. So in conclusion, does anyone know this movie? Does anyone watch this movie? It's a Wonderful Life. I know some people here that really don't like this movie, but that's all right. In this movie, the main character, George Bailey, is really depressed about his life, to the point where he's thinking of ending it. And there's an angel who comes along to show him what life would have been like around his town if he never existed. So they wipe the record and he walks around and he sees what, what life would have been like in the town if he'd never existed at all. And he finds that he had actually, his personal influence had achieved so much despite the current troubles he had that he never realised. When we look at some of the things we've looked at tonight, and let's look, I have to be honest with you, that it's very hard to summarise some of this information and there is so much of it. It goes on. It could go on for hours and hours and hours, even if it feels like it has already. But the thing is, if we have a look at this, if we have a look at Jesus, what if Jesus never existed? What would our world look like today if that one man had never walked this earth? What impact has he had on the world around us, even in areas we might not even realise? What did some of the famous people of history have to say about this figure who dominates so much debate and discussion right until this day? I want you to consider a few of these quotes. This is what Napoleon had to say. This was when he said this after he'd been arrested and he was in prison and he had plenty of time to think. And he said this, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Now, you might think this is him starting to believe. No, he didn't. But this is what he has to say anyway. He says, I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. 
Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. This was at a time when he'd been completely deserted and no one was backing him up. It's an amazing, and there's actually a much bigger statement he makes, which is just amazing to read. You know, we may not be Christians or religious, but every person on this planet today has a lot to owe to this simple man from first century Palestine. As a famous 19th century uh, author of Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky says this, Even those who have renounced Christianity and attack it in their innermost being still follow the Christian ideal. For hitherto, neither their subtlety nor the ardour of their hearts has been able to create a higher ideal of man and of virtue than the ideal given by Christ of old. I mean, that's nice. He's a Christian. He's pretty biased. What did other people have to say? Let us consider what H.G. Wells had to say. H.G. Wells has written one of the most influential books attacking the, the history of the Christian church in the last 30 years. He's one of the most influential writers. He's a historian. And this is what he has to say after all of his writings, after all of his research, this is what he had to say. He said, I am a historian. I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevoc irrevocably the creator, the, the centre, sorry, the centre of history. Jesus is easily the most dominant figure in all history. One writer had this to say. Socrates taught for 40 years, Plato for 50, Aristotle for 40, and Jesus for only three. Yet the influence of Christ's three years of ministry infinitely transcends the impact left by the combined 130 years of teaching from these men, who were among the greatest philosophers of antiquity. As we have seen, the sum of the motives and ideas that people used as direct inspira inspiration for the values we hold in society today came directly from the teaching of Jesus. And these were ideas that were not existent in their society beforehand, hadn't existed through all of written history. What can we link his influence and teachings to have directly influenced? Hospitals, universities, public schools, kindergartens, capitalism and free enterprise, representative government, separation of political powers, civil liberties, abolition of slavery, modern science, women's liberation, charitable organisations, the justice system we have, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Tomorrow night, we're going to be looking at this topic. There's a lot of people who have opinions about who Jesus was and who he wasn't. But what opinion did he have of himself? What did he say? What claims did he actually make about himself and which claims didn't he make? And what do we make of who this man really was? Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I hope that you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask.